Uh, my name is Faraz Siddiqui. I head the solution architecture team here at Cosimo. Uh, this is my second time here at Cloud Field Day. Last time we presented on, on the solution itself, did a kind of a demo on the day zero orchestration and uh, day zero onboarding. I'm going to talk about how customers have been deploying us uh, in their environment and multi-cloud and cloud to data center. But before getting to that, I'm going to show you what are some of the design patterns, connectivity patterns that we are seeing. What's, the, what's under the hood? What's the architecture look like? Just to kind of answer the question here. Um, so there's like, broadly, there are three categories of design patterns or challenges that we have seen with our customer deployments. Number one is setting up networking overlays. You have customers deployed multiple VPCs, multiple VNets. Uh, they have uh, VCNs and, and Oracle Cloud. They have subnets, IP subnets, all of them. They need a kind of a connectivity that can scale in any cloud, in any environment, even within a single cloud across multiple regions. So basic IP to IP routed layer connectivity, what they want. So that's where we provide that consistent underlay that I'm gonna talk about in a bit. Secondly, the service networking. How about your service like FQDNs, destination source and destination applications? It could be your uh, HTTP application, web applications, databases, PaaS applications. How would you connect to those, uh, uh, those applications together? Case in point, the service, service mesh console type services. How do you connect those two services together if they're running in two different clouds, two different regions, using the cloud native underlay, but adding services on top, like, like overlay services. Last but not the least is the full stack transit. Anything talking to anything. It's IP endpoints talking to FQDNs, FQDN tokens to FQDNs, um, your a web uh, applications talking to APIs, uh, web frontends talking to databases, IPs talking to certain applications, users connecting and talking to those applications. So it's a completely full stack transit. And how would you apply policies, provide the right layer of visibility, provide light, right layer of observability and micro segmentation. So these are like broadly the three uh, patterns that we have seen so far in our customer deployments. And I'm gonna go through, uh, I take a, a case study of one of each of these examples. I'm gonna walk you through how customers have been using the same platform, deploying it for all the three different scenarios. Okay, let's see what's under the hood. So typically, so there are two uh, main components to the platform. One is the uh, a SaaS dashboard of sorts, uh, which we offer it as a, as a multi-tenanted SaaS dashboard. It's a control plane. It handles your kind of policy management, configuration management, and all that good stuff. It talks to the data path component that you see uh, uh, in the middle box here, which is called Prosimo Gateway or Prosimo Edge, if you will. Uh, these uh, gateways sits in a customer cloud. It provides the data path connectivity, routing capabilities, proxy capabilities. It runs mul multiple microservices for zero trust access, WAF, client IP reputation, connectivity orchestration, all, of, all, all the things that it kind of handles through the SaaS control plane. Now, few things to notice here is it's, it's a completely cloud native, 100% cloud native solution. So we use the cl existing cloud native constructs to build the underlay. Uh, what we have seen or what we have uh, realized that these uh, cloud service providers, Amazon, uh, AWS, Azure, GCP, they have like put like tons of amount of efforts, money to build these very robust underlays. So we do not want to create and bring our own virtual router on top and then kind of say that we can do them the, do a better job than them. But what we are seeing is that we can orchestrate these underlays for you because it's it's tedious, it's complex to set up these transit gateways, route table manipulations, connecting to a VVAN hub, and then setting up the policies. So we do all the orchestration or do the plumbing all together, but we will make it so simple and so consistent for you that you can swarm a single con control plane, you can deploy application at scale. And then it's uh, for, age, for, for a user connecting to apps, depending on the use case, uh, it works both in client and clientless mode. So if it's a web application, somebody's accessing uh, completely clientless, no agents, no clients required on any of the end user devices. There are certain scenarios what we have seen in our deployments where people are still working with, let's say some SAP, like old legacy application that require a client server type app that could run with an agent on an end user device. The end user agent also helps with the deeper device posture capabilities, posturing capabilities, like look, take, taking a look at if you're running an EDR, if you're running your firewall is turned on or turned off, if you want to block certain processes on the on the system itself. You want to block access if certain processes are not running. Those could be achieved with an endpoint agent, but it's not a requirement for any type of access. So let's take a quick look at control plane. What is it in a control plane? I mean, it's a, it's a SaaS control plane, multi-tenanted. Uh, you every, Anytime when a customer subscribes to the service, they get your own URL, their own uh, tenant for, from the SaaS control plane. 
fully are backed with the permissions, different type of permissions, who can access what portion of the control plane. All of that is being, uh, being offered through this control plane itself. It helps in few things. It's doing the cloud asset discovery in the first place. So it takes the API permissions from your IAM roles from your cloud provider. And then it gives you a, a full discovery of all the assets that are running in that cloud. So let's say if you have AWS, you have 400 VPCs deployed, it discovers all of those VPCs, it discovers all the IPs, IP subnets uh, that, that are configured under those VPCs. It displays that in a nice kind of a, a visualization map that I'm gonna show you in a bit. It works with any cloud provider, so it's cloud agnostic, if you will. Uh, it means GCP, Azure, AWS, uh, AliCloud, or could be OCI. So if you, if you have those clouds, you can easily integrate and orchestrate some of the peering orchestrations like for AWS, we can spin up, let's say, a TGW, create a TGW attachment, we can create a route table entries, uh, manipulate the route tables, all of that is being done through the control plane. So for that, it requires a certain level of permissions that we publish on our, in, our, uh, in our support portal. Of course, nobody will like to give the keys of the kingdom. So whatever the permissions that we need, we publish it on our, on our support website. And there are functions that people can cut. Let's say if somebody is not willing to uh, give us pre-GW orchestration permission, they say, we'll take care of it, just provide us an overlay and policy segmentation, then you do not have to provide those permissions. So those are very flexible permissions with which you can orchestrate and uh, make, your, make the day and operations a little bit easier. So when, when you say multi-tenanted SaaS control plane, are you saying multi-tenanted from your point of view or is it set up by design for partner organizations to then be able to host down level? So it's both. So it's from our point of view, we keep the tenants separate, like a segmentation uh, across different tenants. Mm -hmm. And it's also by, uh, if, if somebody is doing it as an MSP, like a managed service provider, they can create their own customer tenants using this tenant. Okay. It's, it's kind of covers the both models. Is there an integration to vCloud Director? I know you, you said vSphere earlier, earlier, but is that a deployable, like built into the architecture? Using the APIs for sure, yes. Okay. yes. So, so it, uh, sorry, go ahead. So if there's some secure constraints and things of that nature where they don't want to use public cloud, can the control plane run in a private cloud kind of environment or is it? Yeah, so, so for the orchestration piece, since we are doing all of these orchestration using the APIs, so orchestration piece, we could do all of that with the control plane for with the, with the, with the model I'm gonna show. For an on-prem type of deployment, I'm not sure if that's the question, but for the end- no, It's more like uh, you know a government agency or something like that. and. Yeah have requirements for their own cloud. Yeah. Can they run the control plane in that environment specifically or without having to go to, let's say, AWS? I don't know where it runs. So it runs right. in. Right. Sure. Sorry. Yeah, for the largest of enterprises, big banks that have come up where uh, could they get a dedicated control plane? It's not on-prem per se, it still runs in the cloud, but they want to kind of own and manage it and so on. So that has been done for the largest of. So you can actually take a dedicated control plane and then provide to them as well. Some of the MSPs wanted that and say that, hey, I want to run this in my own cloud and then I can want to operate this for my customers. It's a slice of it, but just owned by them. So that's possible. Yeah. yeah. And you, you say by owned in their own cloud, you mean like, like in AWS or yes. Azure or GCP? Yes. Yeah. Just to go back to that question, because there are some compliances in government, government agencies that require you to have hands-on physical uh, solutions. In order for them to meet their compliance needs, do you have a, will the solution work in those environments or are you working towards that? So in terms of the data plane, so there are what we call as connectors. If they want to put some type of software on their premises so that they can connect back, we do have that, Faraz will cover that. But the orchestration layer, which is the control plane, is strictly in the cloud today. But they right. could have a dedicated version if they want it. Thank you. So these, these control plane and the data path components, uh, as I'm gonna talk about the data path in a bit, these are all containers. These are all containerized concepts. So technically, if you could run a container in an EKS, you could run it an on-prem Redshift type of environment. So it's, it's the same thing. It's just that it has, so packaging has to be a little different, but it kind of covers the same functions. So as part of the SaaS control plane, one of the things that we are doing is that we also deploy these, or what we call them telemetry sensors that kind of works in all the three different clouds, all the different type of regions or the edge locations that constantly provide some telemetry information. Like for example, from point A to point B, what's the latency look like? What's the jitter? Is there any session loss, packet loss, those kind of things. We use that data in our analytics engine to uh, drive certain decisions, whether to route the traffic from A to B, whether to route the traffic from A to C through B or through D. So those kind of decisions, 
we make sure we take based on the machine learning algorithms that we run as part of this control plane. So it's not just a control plane uh, doing the configuration management, policy management, all of that. It also runs the, the telemetry sensor network that constantly getting this information through all of these sensor agents. So uh, for the data path component uh, that it, we sit in the data path. So whether it's a tunneled traffic, it's a proxy to traffic, we sit in the data paths. A few things to highlight here. Uh, this, these data paths, these are all regional gateways that we built uh, and we are using Kubernetes under the hood uh, in, in just to get the better scalability, better kind of uh, orchestration, better scalability, We're using the uh, Kubernetes constructs in there and, and also to run multiple microservices. So these are not the virtual machines, if you will. These are more like managed Kubernetes clusters that a, a customer can install in their own environment. Now, what that means is that you are not giving a data out to somebody else. The data path runs in your own environment, in your own cloud subscription. It's kind of go through your own compliance that or governance that you have put in place. So that covers the, the, the security, the compliance efforts of it. Secondly, these, uh, uh, these, these cloud services or these Kubernetes uh, constructs that we build, they come up with a high availability. So we deploy these microservices in two different availability zones. It brings up its own VPCs or VNATs. Uh, if you are in Azure or, or a v, uh, AWS environment, it brings up multiple microservices. It brings all the required components that are there to deploy and that they are there to uh, pass the traffic. So NAT gateways, IGWs, VPCs, uh, you know, uh, worker nodes as part of the Kubernetes clusters. So that's one cloud region or a cloud gateway, if you will. Behind these cloud gateways, you can bring up any, any number of applications, any number of networks, any number of users. Since we are using Kubernetes, it gives us the better scale so it can auto scale up and scale down. Consider the scenario you have 5,000 users accessing certain applications on, let's say, on, on, on Monday morning. Suddenly, the, the load increases to, let's say, 50,000 get requests or 50,000 web requests. So these worker nodes can expand as the load increases. And when the load goes away, when it comes down to, again, 5,000 users, it contracts back or, or kind of uh, shifts back to its original, uh, original uh, kind of uh, footprint. So that's kind of, it's not like you're running a static virtual machine like C5 extra large and you have to run it regardless if there is a load or not. It expands and it contracts. So that's, that gives us this better scale, better scalability. It saves the cost for our customers regard, in, 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 instead of running a static compute cost, they end up paying a much lesser cost than running a virtual machine. Now, one of the questions that, that yeah. always comes to this one, because I'm a fan of disaster, uh, there are a series of failure domains that are introduced with this. Uh, we use data path. We talk about data path. Obviously, traffic has to pass through yeah. your system in order to do it. What are the what happens if lack of availability of your system does it basically halt the data path? Have you changed the routes to yes. my native routing yes. so that you stop, I stop? So, so let's take a look at this in two different ways. So, so first of all, I mean, the, the, since these are uh, stored in a, in a HA pair, so two availability zones, multiple services, multiple microservices, by the nature of using Kubernetes, we can spin up the worker nodes at any given point. Regardless of all of that, let's say the entire edge goes down. Maybe the, not the region, but the entire edge goes down for some reason. So we always bring up, uh, so let's say if a customer has deployed application US East, they can always deploy in a US West cluster and we can make the determination whether to route the traffic to US West if US East health checks are not responding. So if the health checks are not responding for a certain cluster, we can route around and still be provided able to access to the application. Sure, go ahead. So based off of what you just said in terms of, uh, and I just want to clarify, in terms yeah. of Kubernetes being able to spin up nodes, are you using something like cluster API for a supervisor yeah. cluster? Okay. So, so we use the managed uh, EKS, EKS, GK environment. So we use the APIs. Uh, we can uh, use the, some, some of the uh, cluster forming. So we use the YAML files and kind of bring up the clusters, bring down the clusters. So all of them govern through the, the managed EKS integration or EKS integration. So all the APIs that has been shown to us from these cloud providers, we use all of them. So in vSphere, you'd run under Tanzu then? Is that how you? Sorry, come again? So in VMware, you'd run yeah. under Tanzu or? So, so, so for VMware, uh, so I'm go that's the second point I want to talk about. So for certain environments, which cannot be managed, let's say as an EKS or an EKS or a Kubernetes cluster, we do have a virtual machine or sort of an, a connector, if you, if you will, that can run, let's say in a virtualized environment, data centers, 
Uh, it could run, let's say, maybe in a, uh, you know, some KVM, some OpenStack, maybe a Colo, those kind of things. So this, this connector runs essentially the same software, but it packaged differently. What it does is that when you install these connectors, let's say in a data center in a VMware environment, it dials out to connect to his home edge. So let's say if I'm, my data center is somewhere in Ashburn and my closest edge or closest proximo is running in somewhere in US East, that connector will always dial out to the nearest possible closest edge or my home edge. If that edge for some reason is not responding or is not there, it tries to the next available edge available in that cloud. So those are the operations that we make sure that in order to provide connectivity to all different type of workloads, whether it's a cloud workload, data center workload, virtual machine, virtual workloads, we do have two different form factors that we can. Do you have a OpenShift a native implementation as well or only in the managed uh, Kubernetes services? So if I were to run, if I'm running all Rosa or just OpenShift in my own, you know, whatever choice of platforms? Yeah, so we do have, uh, we're working on the integration for, with the, with the Redshift, uh, OpenShift and the, it's more of the orchestration play, uh, if you will. But again, I mean, so we are working with some of the APIs that we want to orchestrate some, some of the things here. Just yeah. wanted to add one thing. Yeah. So with regards to, hey, this runs, the gateways run as Kubernetes clusters in the cloud regions. It's more of a business choice than a technical choice because we try to deploy this as a Kubernetes cluster in colos and on-prem as well, but the level of maturity in different data centers were very, very different. Some knew exactly what to do when we give them, here is a run book, go bring up this cluster. Others like, because these are networking teams sometimes, they're not working with Kubernetes day in, day out. So that's why the connector that goes into colos and data centers are just packaged as two simple VMs, runs a similar set of, set of software, but cloud because the control plane that we run manages all of that, even the network team purchases, they just buy a service. They don't have to understand how EKS works, how AKS works. This is just a service yes. that comes up. They just manage using the SaaS list. So the, the peering back to your multi-tenant SaaS, is this a, a back-end peering or is this simply just like over, over VPC or over VPN communication to the- It's 443 outbound. It's all internet, 443 MTLS, mutual TLS. It's right, just, okay. Yeah. For the customers that implement your solution, I know one of your goals was to reduce tools. Like what, what tools are they- throwing out? Great question, actually. So think about the functions that we are doing in the, in the cluster, right? So first off is the uh, simple load balancing function, right? Uh, you do load balancing across your application endpoints. The, 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 we are using the, the Nginx, is proxy, all, the, all these kind of reverse proxies functions that covers the load balancing function, primary basic function. Then it takes care of SSL offload, TLS termination, so it kind of taking care of some of those uh, ADC type of capabilities there. Then there are basic firewalling required, east-west segmentation, north-south segmentation, all of that. So it covers that. Plus the VPN termination, you do not really need the VPN gateways or any type of SDP or zero trust type of solutions. It covers everything into one. So depending on the use case, if you want to provide connectivity across the cloud and create segmentation, it kind of covers a bunch of these services, which are kind of translates into multiple of these virtual appliances. Third part of that I, I am going to talk about in a bit is the performance angle. If your users are coming all the way somewhere from Brazil and your apps are running somewhere in US East, how do you make sure that the users ingress into the closest possible region? For that, you will either go for a public CDN or you build something in uh, like a DIY using CloudFront and all of that. So this covers that aspect as well. So it takes the user, routes them or ingress them to the closest possible ingress cloud point in order to reduce the, the first mile latency and then ride over a cloud backbone to connect to an application running some, somewhere far away. Plus it's adding all the performance techniques like content caching, web application caching, TCP optimization, multiplexing. So those are those additional performance stack that it kind of covers in under the hood. Thank you. It's, it's always interesting to see how guys think. For us, this background is you know, my CDM. My background is network, I think, grounds up. So first thing, when you're thinking about this existing stack in the cloud, right? I like to call it like the infra Jenga stack, right? You have your virtual routers that are doing networking. So we replace that. You know, you have the L4 through L7 layer, you know, which for us covered in detail, we sort of replace that. In addition, we give you this common set of semantics with which to govern and you know manage policies across this multi-cloud environment. You're not working with the ABCs of the individual clouds anymore. You have grammar enforced, semantics enforced across this multi-cloud transit, right? The fourth piece is when you actually go down to change management troubleshooting workflows on day two, day N, right? Uh, you're using likely, you know, uh, a tool stack in, you know, each of these clouds, possibly in your data center. We also replace all that. And all that is by virtue of actually being in the data path because we have visibility all the way 
uh, across the stack. So those are the tools that we replace in the categories. Speaking of data path, what's, what sort of latency do you think something like this adds to networking activity? So, so let me take a, uh, answer that question in a, in a, uh, by addressing this in a way that, so when you add something in, in between, of course, it adds few milliseconds in there. But then what you are get, gaining out of that is that you, in fact, you are reducing the latency because now when a user is coming over an internet as the first mile, and you're routing them over a cloud backbone versus using the first mile, first of all, that reduces your overall experience of a user. Secondly, uh, we're doing some certain optimization techniques on, on top of an underlay that includes your using HTTP versus quick or using you know, fast, fast TLS, doing TCP multiplexing, content caching, that eventually reduces this overall latency that we are at, that we may are maybe adding just by adding additional hop in between. So what I have, and we, it's not like that we are saying this, we show that in our platform where you do a kind of AB type of testing where you run the, uh, the same level of service or same level of connection via internet or a VPN or maybe some other like an MPLS and then run it through us. So it gives you the side to side difference what exactly that you gain by running the stack, right? So definitely the, the latency will be there like few milliseconds, but it gets covered with all these optimization that we are doing on it. So to make sure I understand what you've got going on here correctly. So Prosimo sees an inbound connection from a region that maybe it's not already currently in. Yeah. Does it then automatically spawn itself into that region? Yes. Okay. So, so what we do is they're not automatically spawned. So what we do is that uh, based on the, uh, the telemetry sensor that I talked about uh, previously, it's, it gives us the information that the user is coming from Brazil and there is no local edge present in that region. It, in the dashboard, it gives recommendation that you have users coming from these many locations, but you do not have a local ingress. Okay. Do you want to improve the performance for these users? It's going to be a cost impact because you're adding additional compute, okay. but you want to take that recommendation. So it, we leave it to customers and then you can, they can make it part of their CICD pipeline where they see, well, if um, uh, some of my users are actually traveling for a sales event, if you see a request automatically go ahead and spin up the cluster. So that's, that's, the, that's the way that we deal with this. Okay. Cool. Out of the pool of, I, I like the use case it has, but it, it's, a, it's a niche use case. Hmm. I would presume, I don't want to pick a number. Let's just, I'm going to pick a number, that pick a number. Let's say 10% of any enterprise applications would actually fit that pattern. 90% will not. Like they will not have the ability to leverage uh, endpoint caching that's going to get them close to like they, maybe more sort of almost like client server apps that we've just sort of shoved sure. into the yes. cloud, right? So not, yeah. not to discount what yeah. you're saying, but it's always a careful thing that like Ray brought up the point that I think we all were sort of thinking is any abstraction adds latency. Yeah. It, does, it seems like it's nominal latency, yeah. but uh, just, it's a careful point that we always want to say we're, we're old folks and we, we run old data. Absolutely systems. correct. So if, uh, if you look at this, right, it's, it's could be a, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> it could be a web app. It could be a tunneling, very chatty application. It could be something like a database calls. It could be a client server application. So for those, instead of running it over an internet, it still gives a better performance while riding over a cloud backbone. So our idea is to use cloud as, as a primary connectivity or a cloud backbone versus creating these still like VPN connection, which has no kind of guaranteed throughput, guaranteed latency. It's always going to vary. Right. By running it through a cloud backbone, providing the best possible ingress, we can at least address it even for these kind of chatty applications as well. Sure, yeah, and, yeah. and of course, it's not meant as a, yeah. a downside to you, it's a downside to applications <laughs> that you know, we, we still have a, right. a large swath of apps that just don't fit well with the neat accelerations that you can bring. Sure. You mentioned earlier uh, on the control plane that you deploy telemetry sensors yeah. Uh, so are they, are they part of this data path, proximal edge, yeah. or are they someplace else? That's like out, like out of band. That's we deployed outside of the data paths. It, it runs as part of our SaaS service, just like we're running a control plane. We, we deploy these sensor agents like proxies in different various cloud regions, different cloud edge locations that provides this kind of information back to our control. So plane. if I have an edge location or something like that, yeah. you would deploy a telemetry sensor there? Outside of whether you deploy the edge or not, the telemetry sensor will still be there. So it's not because of, it's not tied to one customer. It's it's kind of overall SaaS service that we deploy. So ah. yeah. So mm -hmm. consider them as like a small point of presence that we are running constantly to provide us this telemetry data 
all the time, regardless if the customer has deployed a data path element or data path edge there or not. So when you deploy those into it, if you had a data center or a colo, yes. and you don't obviously aren't hosting an agent there for your telemetry, would you put one there then? It would be next close to a, a cloud region. So if it's if it's a data center and let's say in Ashburn, so we we have a telemetry sensor agent running somewhere in, in US East One, US West, like AWS cloud location, Azure cloud location regions and all that. So what happens if um, there's either a failure on the cloud provider side or probably more likely the cloud provider changes overnight one of the um, services y'all require? Yeah. Is that like a massive failure for your customers or how does that work? So, so that's an excellent question, right? So if you look at this, I'll give you an example, a, a, a real life example here, right? So AWS announced something like last year, CloudVan, which takes things differently, works differently from TGWs. Now, for a customer to get to that platform, first of all, they have to know what the feature is, how does it work to, in order to deploy this. Secondly, they have to train their team so this whole skill gap kind of comes into picture. If they are using a solution like us, so we were we partner with all the three, like all the major CSPs out there, so we get to see the, the feature ahead of time. So we work with, in conjunction with the customer, in fact, we were the launch partners last year with for AWS CloudVan. So with that, customers can still use us and orchestrate that connectivity without even knowing what the, how the feature works. They only want to address a use case. I want any to any connectivity using a cloud van. I want to uh, put the policies on top. How do I do it? We will orchestrate the plumbing for you. You just show us your intent, what the use case is, how you want to connect your applications. We take care of the rest, and rest of the backend plumbing. Yeah. So if some things like these happen, we are ahead of the curve working with, with these cloud providers and, and, and our CSP partners so that we get to know these details a little earlier than our, our regular customers. So if something changes, of course, we make, they're changing the APIs, changing the way they appear, we get to know these details a little earlier and we react to it quickly. And what if there's a failure on the cloud provider side? Uh, you mean the complete failure on the cloud provider? So, uh, just a failure of maybe one of the services you guys are mm -hmm. abstracting. Yeah, so, so we run, sorry, you want to add? So two transitions there, right? One is sort of the sleep moving transition, that, you know, Faraz talked about where they're either migrating a construct, changing the behavior of a construct. We obviously have advanced knowledge of those and, you know, we, we build those into our orchestration engine. Second is sort of the unintended uh, sort of failure, right? Let's say they change the underlying hardware and performance now sucks all of a sudden, right? There's two, two signals that we get. One is the actual operational insights from the customer's accounts, right? I mean, this if traffic is flowing between these workers, we're able to re react faster. Let's say there is no operational data from any of my customers, right? No traffic is gone. By virtue of having this cloud sensor network, I'm still privy to the performance of this uh, of this region, right? So um, uh, the, the Prosimo dashboard based of these two, two signals is able to react much faster than having sort of a, rea a reactive approach that, okay, only when operationally sort of goes through or real traffic goes through, I'll find out that performance sucks, right? Uh, so we're covered in both those cases, right? So think of this cloud sensor network as a sort of an outside arbiter of performance and, and you know, fault tolerance, if you will. Uh, if our data path element goes down by virtue of being a full mesh transit, uh, we have fault tolerance built into the design. Yes. In addition to having, you know, fault tolerance by design as part of the clustering path. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with interest. I have yeah, one, one quick question before yeah, yeah, you go. The previous slide, actually, you had Terraform and Swagger Editor kind of listed in, in that control plane box. Yeah. Is this, do you, are you a Terraform provider? Do you create a provider, provide a provider? So we are, so we are, so we are a Terraform uh, provider. So we have a Terraform provider for our, whatever you see in the, in the, in the UI, in the, in the dashboard, everything can be programmed. And Eric has a nice demo in a, in a bit, in a couple of minutes. It's going to show the entire CD pipeline. How do you bring up these like six different regions and different cloud providers, bring up few applications, connect them, see the observability stack, all of that through the terraform. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a discovery flow that if you will, uh, it provides you, provide us the information like IAM account, IAM roles with the right required set of permissions. It discovers how many regions you are running VPCs in, in those VPCs, how many subnets you are running, in those subnets, which specific subnet you want to select to onboard and attach to this Prosimo Edge Gateway or Prosimo Gateway. So you follow this process, you connect all of your endpoints, whether it's applications, network endpoints, pass services, for us is just an endpoint. You attach all of these endpoints to the, to the fabric or a mesh, and then it takes care of all the connectivity routing, 
setting up policies, setting up, uh, let's say, you know, transit gateway attachments, VWAN hub attachments, all of that in the background. So if you look at this, just take an example of two cloud providers. There are three different type of endpoints. First one in the left, right, uh, leftmost box is the IP address. Second is the FQDN or an actual application. Third one is the platform services. Now, three different endpoints that may or may not require three different underlying constructs to connect to. Some of your VPCs are attached through a transit gateway. So somebody needs to bring up a transit gateway. Somebody needs to create an attachment. Somebody needs to create and configure the route table entries. All of that is work. Secondly, if you are attaching just simply to a, a, a web application or database, you could use a simple VPC query. Then there's a third category, which is platform services, data lakes, S3, DynamoDB. All of these are data, all of these are past services that require private links, private link endpoints. So in order to, in just one cloud and one, in just one regions for three different endpoints, you are actually touching probably more than four or five services. And that just, just, just for connectivity. Now think about, you have to build a security stack on top. You have to build a performance stack on top. You have to build an observability stack on top. So that's, that means you are kind of touching more than, I, I would say probably 20, 25 services. Somebody needs to do that, right? Either you bring an uh, kind of external virtual machine, some, some sort of an appliance or some sort of a vendor, or you orchestrate all of that. So what we are showing, uh, uh, saying that we orchestrate all of this, just tell us which endpoint is it that you want to connect. If you want to connect us to a VPC endpoint or an application endpoint, in the back end, we, we're gonna spin up these services in order to connect to these endpoints. Same case for Azure. So if somebody is very savvy, tech savvy in, in AWS, now Azure works differently. If you take a simple example of gateway load balancer, it's different, uh, com it's worked completely different in AWS versus Azure. So if you understand AWS, GW, uh, gateway load balancer functionality doesn't mean it works the same in Azure. So somebody needs to understand, somebody needs to configure the, the right configuration the right way, we take care of all of this. So we abstract the underlying connectivity that is required in order to connect your one VPC to a VNet on the right-hand side of in Azure. So if I'm running yeah. um, my infrastructures as code yeah. and I have um, everything automated, can this be can this be added to pipelines yes. that I already have to bring up the network? Yes, okay. absolutely. Yes, yes. That's that's exactly the demo that we have, that we have built for this. What do you do for managing changes over time? So let's you know because one of the things you know I'll say uh, isovalent is a neat thing called the Hubble Timescape, where it actually will capture the state and keep it like a time machine, effectively. So you can go back and say at a particular point. There was a connectivity issue. And then we can look at the, both the configuration and the error rates and error logs. And so you've got the both observability as well as a point in time capture of a time series database to know what the state was of policies. Yes. So we could actually match up. Yes. You know, did that occur? So, you know, all of a sudden you go like, hey, last Monday we had a whole stream Absolutely. of errors that show up. Yes. Yes. And you're looking at it's like, oh, it's because because of that one Pete API turned on the policy into enforcement yeah. and uh, aha, okay. Yes. So so in a, in a, I'm, I'm not going to kind of steal the, again, the thunder from Eric, but there are there is a use case in there where you configure a wrong IP. If somebody go in and configure a wrong IP. How does it react? How does it show all the visibility and how you can go back and fix that to, to continue with the time series? So we have that example there. Uh, as part of the as part of this demo, which is coming up. So right. the only thing I want to add on to the observability piece is one thing is you could do reactive things because now you have the time machine type capability. Other one is because we sit in the data path, we have this off-band observability telemetry we talked about, as well as all of the health check metrics coming from our data path. We could take routing decisions on the fly based on the observability we're getting and saying that if users could come in from this specific cloud region, use Azure Backbone instead of AWS Backbone in this case, they would get 30% better performance. Or if it's an east-west traffic, if we route via Equinix versus Megaport for this particular application, this is getting much better performance. All those are fed back from the observability stack into a data path decision stack that's happening all the time. Excellent. Yeah, because always the classic like, observability is is meant as not just a you know data that you capture and you yes. log. It's it's the questions that you ask of the system that yes. can be taken from the signals that are available, but it also requires you to have an understanding of state at the point in time that you ask the question. Right. And, and unfortunately, you know, we often lose that. We we call something observability, not, not saying that this is clearly, you're hitting the right mark. A lot of monitoring companies suddenly said they were observability because it was a Gartner buzzword. 
and that but they had no ability to actually manage state at points in time across time series and that's like correct makes sense one of the reasons why we wanted to be in the data path as well not just in the observer right yeah yeah because it's critical to understand exactly what happened when why and then ultimately to and, and what is heal. the and what is the reactionary thing one is that you understand what's going on and what's going to happen right so you that's the reason we are running these these sensors that can provide us that if something is a path is showing some deterioration how you can route around so those are the things that we have put in place to in order to even avoid those congestion or kind of lossy mid miles of sorts so let me uh, so kind of an example of how you can kind of uh, a day zero multi cloud multi region transit with few clicks you can kind of click on bring up a proxima gateway attach it to a proxima gateway uh, bring up a, a tgw or orchestrate a tgw create an attachment connect it to a multiple like 400 plus vpcs all of that is done through a like a few simple clicks so that's kind of a one quick kind of a snapshot of what what you could do or what you can achieve with the with the control plane with the dashboard itself so uh, talked about multiple things. Uh, how how does the policy segmentation? So I want to uh, touch upon what does this policy look like, right? So you have two different endpoints. You have Confluence talking to some SQL DB. You have an IP address talking to another IP address. So you can create these kind of policies in order to create the authorization framework. So for an IP endpoint, if you want them to have an allow all, you can create an allow all. You want cert, uh, put certain things like a classic five tuple. Uh, you have to you know, allow or block on certain things, you can create those filters and match conditions. It could be a completely web app framework where you are, web app is talking to an API that needs to check the client certificate or X509 certificate, you could do those kind of things. So depending on the application endpoint type, depending on the endpoint itself, you can apply certain policies that could you know, not just restrict it to this, but just the example of what are the match conditions that you can match for, like five tuple policy, source IP, destination IP, source and target, name tags, any type of mutual TLS, X509 certificates, what are some of the actions that you can take, you can allow, you can deny, you can revoke a session, you can simply create an alert using a service hook or a webhook if you want to really allow this specific traffic pattern or not. So those are the things that you could do with the policy engine. Now quickly coming to zero trust network access, so same platform, you could use same edge gateways, same regions, nothing has changed from the platform angle. It's just that the use case is different. Now, it's not the connectivity within the cloud, it's connectivity to the cloud. You have are users. You, are you doing, yeah. I don't know, I guess the term is deep packet inspection. Mm -hmm. So I would call it deep packet inspection, but we are kind of, what we are doing essentially, we are looking at every other transaction or these gateways this are looking at every other transaction. Yeah. Since we are sitting in the data path as a reverse proxy, so anytime when, I, when we terminate the TLS from users or applications, it kind of displays that this is what it is using or this is what it's connecting to. Do you want to allow this communication or not based on certain policy filters and match conditions? So it's it's kind of the similar functionality, but we are not really a deep packet inspection device of sorts. Yes, yeah, so DPI typically look at like packet heuristics to guess what type of packet it is rather because we are a reverse proxy. Yeah. We can actually understand this is the URL, this is a transaction, this is the API call. So your policies would be based on actual say, I want to allow this URL this admin comes in, they have full access. The other one comes in, they only have read-only access. You can really go deeper into the policies there. Well, but I mean, so your your observability is primarily done and, and reporting back is primarily done effectively on connection state on the mesh, correct? It's not, is it going through and doing your machine learning and saying, this is a type of data traffic that we don't typically see yeah. and we're going to report Okay. So it, it sees different things. So first is the static filters that you configure. Then the ML engine basically provides that. We haven't seen this user accessing this application in past, let's say 90 days or 60 days. This, this is a new user. Or this user used to work from his home location. Now this, the, use, the request is coming from a coffee shop. We want to allow this. So we detect those uh, conditions and uh, the platform creates like, we call them speed bumps, yeah. kind of creating some hurdle to uh, to allow or authenticate the session. So we create like step up auth. So if a user is coming in within two minutes time difference, one request from the same user ID is coming from, let's say from Virginia, second is coming from Australia, it's not technically, it's not physically possible, right? So the platform creates a speed bump. It asks the user to identify yourself one more time. Although you have authenticated with an IDP, you have put in your credentials MFA, but you need to provide your authorization one more time because this, this access, it seems abnormal. So once 
it uh, the user accepts it or user kind of provide additional information, then it creates a, a new baseline for this user or this is specific access. Now, if there is any deviation from this baseline, it's always going to be a speed bump. So it's one type of static filter that you configure as part of filters. And then that second part, which is the dynamic posture that is the platform is doing. Uh, to extend to what Ray was talking about before, the idea of like, so you, deep packet inspection is generally the practice we have, but a lot more people are using stuff like eVPF to be able to pull stuff from in the service, from down below. One of the challenges that I see though, is if you actually pair up with an existing service mesh that already has MTLS active, but it's not um, mesh to mesh, you're creating a mesh to mesh. How can you actually unpack a full TLS packet when it's actually been basically hidden from you. So there's a certain amount of application information you won't be able to see it because it's actually terminated at with TLS at the end point. So if there, if, so we, so being a running and correct me if I'm wrong, if, so running in the reverse proxy in, in a reverse proxy mode, as long as we are terminating the TLS, we have the capability to either re-encrypt the packet back. So at least we see the request, what is the get request or a post request. Right. If it's a tunnel-based traffic, it's end-to-end -end tunnel, it's not kind of showing any web layer information, then yes, so we, we at least see the endpoints, both endpoints, but the deeper transactional level information, of course, it will be hidden from us. Yes. So you, the, yeah, at least we can say basic routing, but yes. you lose some of the four to seven capabilities. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. You got it. If it's kind of mesh to mesh, we have two choices, what we call as a tunnel mode, which is yeah. just layer three tunnel, which means we're not privy to what's going on at the transaction right. level. But if they want us to be under the proxy layer where we can see and say, hey, this mesh, the service is it even supposed to talk? Then they have to make us under the reverse proxy. It's yeah. called proxy. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, and I'm taking down a use case. It's like a disturbingly difficult use case, but it's hey, that's why we're here. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and any in any large enterprise, you can actually see these kind of different use cases. Right. I mean, yeah. So start... you've got Istio and console. Yeah, they hate both, and they want yeah. something else, and yeah. so now you have three problems. Yes. <laughs> so. A typical example, uh, the, the users are connecting from different locations. I, I talked about it a little earlier that it kind of routes the traffic to the closest possible ingress, closest possible entry. That could be a cloud region or that could be a cloud edge locations. So we make use of AWS Global Accelerator or Azure Front Door or Google uh, GCP edge locations, not only to bring the user to a cloud region, but also route them through a edge location. So sometimes if I'm connecting from here, from San Jose, let's say to a, a US West, it could be 15, 20 milliseconds. What if there is an AWS edge running somewhere in the San Jose downtown? I can ride over that backbone, cutting down my extra five, five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, and then ride over AWS backbone all the way from first mile. So we make use of some of these underlying techniques in order to improve the user experience or the performance for these users who are connecting to those apps. And, and of course, we do some of things like for the web application, we do content caching. So if, if a, a many number of a group of users accessing a similar kind of a web content, it could be cached to the nearest edge location. So these are things we are doing uh, for the zero trust access in terms of performance and security capabilities. So when I talk about security, similar to uh, uh, the, the multi-cloud networking, the, in the platform itself kind of covers all of these different uh, kind of uh, performance or different type of uh, capabilities as, in terms of security. Inline WAF, so it has an inbuilt app. You do not really need a web application provider, if you will. Uh, one more service that we just talked about. Client IP reputation, integration with an existing identity solution for user auth authorization. It does the deeper device posture. Uh, things like, I mean, if I'm run, not running a firewall on my, on my laptop, I should not be able to access this specific app. So you can go down as deep as possible with the posturing capabilities. Look at looking at the same level of similar level of filters as you see with the multi-cloud connectivity. You can kind of create the some, some some type of filters, match conditions, what you can match on user IP addresses, geolocation, source IP addresses, destination IP addresses, SAML attributes, OIDC OAuth attributes, which you can block access, WAF policies like OWASP and all that. So all it comes as part of one 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 of that edge gateway. Now consider that that it's running so many microservices uh, within that cluster without requiring you to install these multiple virtual machines for each and every service. So in, in, in a way, it's kind of doing the cost consolidation, kind of tools consolidation for you. So one edge, which is providing connectivity between your clouds, across your cloud, across the cloud and data center, same cloud gateway or same edge gateways providing the user to application access in a secure manner. Do you also provide a, a VPN client for users to run locally? 
there is no VPN client required with this. No, because, but is it an option? Like if, if, if they didn't want to also run a VPN appliance, yes. is, does this take over that part too? Yes. So so we do run the, the VGW or, or the VPN gateway as part of the, uh, the one of the connectivity pairing option. If you want to use your existing VPN deployment, you can do it. Yes. But the goal is, hey, I have my existing VPN. Can I eliminate my VPN with this? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. We yeah. have a client base. For all of the IP traffic, non HTTPS traffic, you could use you the use client or agent that we provide. Mm -hmm. For web traffic, you could use the reverse proxy function. Essentially, you will not require another VPN for users to securely access. Right. And the the you on back on the previous slide, we were talking about the detection of uh, like a, a user's identity or the device posturing. A lot of those solutions have some capabilities like that already. Like Okta or Azure has the capabilities to detect unusual activity. Are you just configuring those pieces in those identity providers, or are you saying turn those off and we'll just use what's inside of Procedure? So, so with the identity provider like Okta and Azure, uh, what they do is the basic like authentication authorization. So we want to leverage the authentication authorization so that the token will be set at the Okta's level. But the rest of the policies we want to uh, con con configure in, in our uh, platform. We can also import import some of the existing policies. Let's say you have configured very granular group-based policies in Okta. Mm -hmm. We can import those policies. So we become the enforcement point, if you will. If you do not want us to filter our traffic, we can become an enforcement point. But then we add on top all the dynamic risk posturing, context aware, and all of that. Okay, so that's on your platform, not yes. in Okta in that yeah. case. Yeah. Well, Sorry, just one point on that. Think of there are two cycles there. One is the authentication cycle, getting a token from IDP. Right. They do detect anomalies to figure out that they suddenly are coming right. from one of the countries. That cycle they could continue. What happens on the data path? Once you get a token from IDP and then you're going through our data path, there might be anomalies where somebody else could take your token and come from there. They might spoof this. Those kind of activities or your activities could be suddenly you're downloading tens of gigs of files. That's a data path activity and authentication provider cannot detect. Since we are a proxy, we can figure out that, hey, your token is fine, mm -hmm. but the activities in the data path look anomalous. We're going to cut off access. Okay. okay. There was a question on yeah, I mean, so if you don't have an agent on the end on some of when you're when you're more trusted in devices, endpoint devices, yeah. so the clients, the people that would use a VPN client, yeah, how are you determining that device posture at the? Do they have their updates installed? Do they have antivirus? Do they have the things that we don't want to allow into this trusted path? How are you determining that? Without the agent, uh, so we for that, this kind of kernel or device level information, we need an agent running on the device. Okay. If it, there is no agent, we can still do what we call lightweight posture, which means it checks for client side certificates. Okay. If, if it's a company issued device, if it's an organization issued device, are you running the right X509 certificate? Are, and do you want to authenticate with the CA? So th th those things we do like browser check, browser kind of Chrome versions, OS versions, we do without any type of agent. But okay. any type of device signals where we need information from their device, we do uh, run an agent for that. And that's just a tie-in with like the sort of the, the classic Beyond Corp model, right? Yes. Which is the that's the Okta Correct. CLFT tie-in. Yes. Like that. So yeah. That's right. Okay. So quickly getting on to the let me see. So probably last part of this is uh, using cloud as a backbone. Now, when I say cloud as a backbone. It could mean different things to different people. You could have underlay connectivity. You have Azure's Express Route, you know, Direct Connect gateways, and all of that running, right? Now, how do you turn it into sort of an optimization swim lanes? So, depending on the application, choose the right optimization lane in order to either improve the cost or performance. So, in a in a in a product, there are four different type of lanes that we create or that we uh, let customers configure. One of them is the cost savings lane. As you could see the very last on the right hand side, your app is running somewhere in the EU central region. And if you have users coming, let's say from San Diego, from some home location remotely. Now, if you do not want any to spin up any additional infrastructure resources, any compute, you can still use the World Wide Web. I mean, you can use the internet to connect this user all the way to an application running in EU central. What is the benefit of doing this mode or running with this mode? Any type of non-critical applications like staging applications, development applications, which doesn't require a lot of performance uh, kind of requirement or latency requirements, you can still route the traffic through internet, but you get all the security policies, security posture assessment, everything through in a cost savings mode. Now, next to that on the left is the performance enhance. Now you have a little business critical application, which is which requires certain SLAs, certain performance requirements. There you could use the uh, Prosimo gateways in a, in a 
distributed proxy mode. What that means is that we will bring the traffic or we run a, like, like a classic CDN fashion. We bring a user to a closest possible Proximo edge location, maybe somewhere in US West because the user is coming from San Diego. So we recommend that user is coming from San Diego, trying to access an application somewhere in EU Central. Here is a location in, in AWS where you can spin up an edge because the application is also running in AWS. So now customers can bring up these, uh, take these recommendations, bring up additional edges, which means additional compute now, but the performance will be way much more better because now you're riding over a cloud backbone. You're not going, taking the internet all the way to your last mile. Third on the left, which is, which is a fast lane. In a fast lane mode, we further improve it by using constructs like AWS global accelerator regions or Azure front door regions which may be more close to the user, right? So if the user is coming from San Diego, maybe there is a, the, the edge location running or there are edge locations running all across the globe, which can cut down my first mile latency. So in this way, I can further improve my performance and prefer, further improve uh, uh, my overall latency. And that gives me the best possible kind of connectivity, performance, all of that using all the way to the cloud backbone. So these are three lanes that you can configure for any cloud, for single cloud. Now there's a fourth one, which is interesting. In the fourth one, what we do is that we ask or we enable our customers to select a multi-cloud connectivity option in the dashboard. So which means now, let's say you have AWS Edge, or your application running in AWS, but you do not have a local AWS run, run Edge running close, close to the user, but you do have an Azure location in, in US where you can run these Proximo edges. So we can bring a user to an Azure Proximo edge, ride over Azure backbone, and then connect to an application running in AWS by kind of going through a right exchange point close to EU central region. So in this way, you are using multi-cloud as your architectural backbone footprint. Or let me take a second scenario. You have AWS and Azure edge both running in the US West one region and you have application, uh, the, the app is itself is running in EU Central in AWS. When a user comes in, we basically determine using the, again, the telemetry network that which backbone, is it an Azure or AWS, which is performing better in that, in that real time. So if Azure is saying, I can take this user to connect to an application running in AWS in 15 milliseconds and AWS saying I can connect in 25 milliseconds, we can make the routing policy decision at that day. So, so this, all this dynamic kind of path selection is all happening in the background where customers do not need to get involved with all kind of changing BGP routing and all of that. It's all being taken care of. Now, the obvious question could be, there will be a cost associated, of course, because you are egressing out of one cloud and going into another cloud. So that, that's something a customers can make uh, an obvious choice that I want like 100% SLAs and I do not want to, my regions to go down in AWS. I need an alternate path they can go with the last option. They can enable a multi-cloud backbone to access an app which is running maybe in a data center or maybe in just one single cloud. So these four lanes kind of cover cloud as a, a holistic backbone capacity. Well, but there, is, so effectively the lane's a choice? Yes. So, and is there a tiering to it or application in certain situations? So for example, I may have application X that I absolutely want to be performance enhanced, but this monitoring tool over here, I'm more interested in it being cost. Correct. So you could choose these lanes depending on the app itself. Okay, so it's app-based. It's an app-based okay. setting that you can configure. So you can choose depending on, you can club them together. Let's say category of apps requires certain treatment. You can do that as well. Okay. Yeah. Do you pull in, uh, so the idea of, of course, egress, ingress, costing, as well as just latency costing, but actual costing where you could see an opportunity to say like, hey, based on this path, we could optimize both, you know, like where's that trade-off occur where you say like, I could reduce my cost of egress by 20%. However, it could add a certain amount of latency. There's going to be now interesting policy level intelligence that has to be added on what your SLO is. Yeah, absolutely. We have a section called guide. That's exactly the combination will tell you that for these categories of applications in AWS US West, if you do this tuning, move them to express lane one, it's going to increase the performance of employees across XYZ region by 40%. With that, the cost will increase by, let's say, uh, 400 bucks per month for these applications. We want to take this choice. These are choices that are provided. 
balancing cost versus performance. performance. Mm -hmm. They can either decline it saying that I don't want this recommendation or you can say that I'd like that. 300 bucks is fine for this critical applications. I'll take that, right? Very cool. And they can create their own custom guide, guides as well. So you do not have to rely on what we are providing them as guides. They can create their own custom guides to do that. Yeah, we last saw when you said autonomous was in the early slide and we don't, I don't want to take you right there yet. This is the interesting <laughs> yes. part of like, you can't be autonomous until you can do this right. You yes. present the decision and the decision is made by uh, meat bags. And then the, once the meat bags <laughs> make the decision enough times, then they turn it over to the software. <laughs> so the thing that I'm kind of struck with is I keep seeing all this and the other solutions and they all are based on constructs that are very cloud native, which is great, but it feels like does all of this kind of capabilities and all the capabilities we're talking about, does that extend to that data center connector as well? So yes. if I have active directory controllers sitting in a vSphere cluster somewhere, do I get to apply all those same kind of rules for yes. that? Absolutely correct. So all of these rules that you're seeing here, it's equally applied because I, as I said initially, software is the same. Just the packaging is different. We package it in a, in a data center or virtual machine format. It's the same software running on these connectors as well. It, it's just a method of deployment is different, if you will. Okay. And can it um, be, okay, so we're seeing, I think these are screen, or I'm not sure if these are screenshots. I know we saw some screenshots of the UI. Yeah. So those things can be, these, these um, tasks can be extracted with API on-prem as well. So if I'm yeah. doing bare metal, yes, then absolutely. I can add this to the pipeline. Absolutely correct, yes. Can, can I ask a clarifying question really quickly? Um, because we did ask some some questions around uh, if cloud services went down, if these gateways that we're deploying in this Kubernetes architecture, if those went down, everything would still run. Like if you're, if, if K8s just died, right? Everything, the whole, Overlay wouldn't, would still be up. Everything would still be running Correct. and underlay and everything, yes. right? That is spot on. So we're kind of fail open from that perspective. Let's say one of the edges go down for whatever reason. And then if they have other cloud native constructs, we don't touch those. So continue to exist as well. Right? Okay. okay. Dashboard. So quick dashboard kind of a, a preview. You will probably see more details with the Eric's demo, but SAS dashboard here, I could log in. I could integrate with my identity provider. First thing, what you would see is like all the edges being deployed, different type of flows being created. What's the transit health look like? How much data being, in, being used and all. Now, what I talked about earlier was, I, I think we were discussing about these the, is the recommendations. So it, this provides like a different type of guides to the customer that says you have users coming in from, from let's say you, AWS US West one, you have users coming from AP South one, AP Southeast two, AP Northeast one, but you do not have any edge running there. You want to improve the performance, let's say by 39% launch these edges here. Now, as a customer, I can go to my, my guide section it here. the performance because of the caching and those sorts of things that you start to bring to bear at the edge? Yes, caching plus the ingress to the close to the user. So if instead of a user going over, let's say an internet and get to go through like all the BGP routing and all that, now you're there going over a cloud backbone. Just like little stable, better kind of capacity, better latency metrics and all. So I can select, let's say for one of my application I want to, I have three different guys showing up. First of them is showing that there is a 45% performance change. There will be some cost impact because we're bringing additional compute and you can say, okay, I, this guide will actually bring five different edge locations or edges in AWS in all these regions. Let's say I do not want to kind of spend more on compute or more on cost. I can select maybe a happy medium in between these two where I am still improving about 31%, but I'm, I'm spending less. So I can select one of these guide and hit deploy. Once I deployed this, not only it will launch these three edges, it's, it is also saying that you have an edge running in AWS and AP Southeast one, but you do not have any users showing up from this region. So it will spin down or kind of decommission the edge in that location. So that eventually kind of give you the cost savings um, instead of running it constantly without any user. So this concept is, think of this as an elastic fabric of sorts, right? So it's not a static mesh network. You deploy all the time, it just runs the same way. It keeps giving you recommendations either based on east-west pattern or user access pattern saying that it's better to align, realign this fabric in a way that you can save cost or improve performance. You can change them maybe once in a month, take a look and say that, hey, how is my fabric looking? What is it costing right now? And then you can adjust them on an ongoing basis. For all the data and logs that are streaming out of this, can they be sort of pushed to, so we could like subscribe to a Kafka topic yes. or different ways yes. that we could pull that in? Because it's 
generally what happens is they've got 17 platforms that have similar streams of data that are pouring out and yes, it's, uh, it's going to pull it into one console. So we do have the logs, different log risk and receivers. You can send it to a Splunk, any type of Kafka topics, all of that. Even service tickets, you can integrate with service now. For example, if you're receiving certain, the threshold has gone above 50%, send a service ticket, create a service ticket in service now, you can do all of that. Integration. Great. There were some questions on how do the how does the fabric come up? What's the discovery? Maybe quickly show the discovery part. We're just building a user to app. App is one traffic pattern, but I'm just building this foundational connectivity across the regions and clouds. What does it look like, right? This is the so discovery I can, part. Yeah. So I get the account information from you. I, it will discover. Okay, I have all of these different regions created. I have multiple VPCs in running. Uh, I want to let's say select EU Central, I have six VPCs. Out of that, I want to only onboard this specific uh, subnet here, which has three different subnets running. Out of these slash 28s, I only want to onboard slash dot uh, 32 slash 28. I simply click on board, provide some ne network name one, and that will basically configure or attach this to my Proximo gateway. You can do similarly these things for other edge locations, some are as uh, other subnets and different cloud providers. It takes you through all the series of steps like plumbing that is required, do you want to spin up a TGW, do you want to do a PC, VPC peering, do you have an existing TGW that, you, that your VPC is already attached? So not only it can run in a green field environment, it could run in a complete brown field. If you're running existing TGW, you just want to ingest it, you can simply select a TGW, use an existing TGW, and it will orchestrate the attachment, the route required routing, everything. One of the things I was mentioned before, yeah. many talked about uh, fail open, and obviously that's uh, the, the best practice. It's for survivability, right? Like, so yep. business yeah. continuity. Is there certain policies in here where you can say at a certain threshold, certain SLO, certain error rate level that something's gone wrong? Would you sort of self detect that and have a fail open option, or does the client side choose that? We fail over to another Proximo edge in another region. If, for example, multiple regions get knocked down from edge perspective, software bug, whatnot, you can say just fail open to cloud native model as well. Right. That's, that's yes. an option you can set. <laughs> Yeah. This here is a view of the full mesh transit. So even if one of your edges fails, let's say Azure West failed, users simply ingress the next closest one that provides the best performance based on, you know, telemetry. So or even unhealthy segments, right? I mean, some of them are unhealthy se healthy segments, why they are unhealthy, what's the latency look like. So it gives you very detailed information about all of that. So you, you get to see all these metrics, right? From a bird eye view in a cloud explorer, find out how my uh, fabric, how my mesh is reacting to certain things. And based on that, you can create a CD pipeline to, if you see certain threshold go, goes above this, spin up an edge or spin down an edge. Those kind of things you can take a measure. And your network DVR is right up there on top with the events timeline. So it's actually built into the product. Yeah. You could actually scroll back to a point in time, yes. see what the issues were. And if you want to sort of manage drift across configuration, right, you could tie that to an IAC pipeline. Who is the tool intended for? Because um, it's, it's very easy to click through all of this, but the, it hides a lot of the complexity. But if you don't know exactly what you're trying to do and what you want to do, it seems like you could get um, underwater really quick. So who uses this tool? The primary uh, target is a cloud platform architects for thinking that, hey, I'm putting this infrastructure in place so I can solve for many of these use cases, which is network connectivity, mm -hmm. users accessing the application securely. So they got to understand the basic framework of What's a transit gateway? What's a virtual van? At least that level of understanding is needed, but they don't need to tinker with this individual services. So 14 services of AWS, 35 other services of others cloud. It's all abstracted, but they got to have an understanding of what they're doing. Is there a place where, because all those services underneath change all the time, and I'm, you know, you already said that you pick those up and yep. incorporate them. But there is, a, is there a place someplace that shows them all of the cloud services that they're consuming? So there's yep. an awareness. Hundred percent. The dashboard itself, the cloud explorer. If you show that, hey, what is going on in this region? It tells in terms of this is Proximo gateway uh, edge. These are the services that it's consuming. Here is a transit gateway. It shows all of the services that is all operating underneath the covers. And then what's the cost associated with them? Yeah. Right. Yeah. What's the? How do you? What? How do you cost this? Or what's the cost involved in using Proximo? Is it on a per transit basis or trans? You know, connection basis or Endpoint basis or? Yep, I'll give a 30 second answer on pricing part. Uh, there are three different types of attachment you could do. Let's say you build this multi-cloud mesh fabric that exists for a reason, but we don't charge because that's a means to an end. What is the end? You're either attaching users, it could be your partners or employees, there's a per user license cost for that, or you're actually attaching multiple VPCs. I have 1500 VPCs, I want to connect them, I want to write policies of them. So you could, there's a per VPC charging model. If you're looking at this as a 
networking platform to interconnect VPCs and VNets. The last is the DevOps team doing app to app networking. Hey, I have this 1500 FQD ends and I want to write policies, everything based on application layer. The third costing model is based on per application, either it's per user, per network, or uh, per FQD and based on that. Yeah. We're sort of able to do that uh, because we have an elastic transit, right? Um, if you compare and contrast it with a provider, like the commercials of a provider that has set up a static network for you, they're forced to amortize the cost of that, um, even in a pay-as-you-grow model. Here, we are truly elastic in the context of every single customer, right? So it gives us the flexibility to charge them on the, on the, on the basis of the entities that they're using, not on the basis of the footprint of their deployment, right? The Prosimo deployment. All right. I have a quick question yeah. or, or just maybe a comment. Kind of following up on Gina's question about like your, your audience, right? Is this for like your typical traditional networking guy on the team? And it's sort of like, okay, network, this is the new way of networking, yeah. future networking. That's a good question. I would say it depends on who you ask, right? So, um, you know, I, my background is infrastructure before I came and left Microsoft. At Microsoft, they picked up a lot of the DevOps stuff and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, kind of the new modern world, if you will, yeah. right? Um, so my view is that this is great for app teams, right? Because it helps simplify a lot of the work that they would normally lean on infrastructure teams to do. Um, so again, if you ask a, a network person to configure a VPN gateway between a couple of different cloud providers, piece of cake, right? They, they understand VPN. For a developer, that's that's a much harder task, right? And it's yeah, not because they couldn't do it. It's because there's a lot of effort there that's outside of what they should be focusing on. Now, from a network person, though, I would say, yes, this is also for them as well. Because when we look at network people, you know, their job typically in the cloud is, is that's not their full-time job, right? You know, they've got 150 manufacturing locations globally that they're supporting from a networking standpoint, right? That's their full-time job. And then usually in the cloud, it's very minimal, right? So talking about the complexities, all the services that are changing, being added all the time, the different nuanced things between clouds. Yes, this abstracts all that away for them. It makes their job easier when they do get that request to say, hey, I need to connect this VNet or VPC into you know, our corp environment because I need to give some data source that's sitting on prem instead of the infrastructure person that again is spending 10 percent of their time in the cloud they no longer have to go well how do i think about this what do i need to learn i forgot how to provision this thing so from that angle yes it's very very simple for them to just pick but up most organizations board. uh really don't allow your app and dev team to to touch a lot of this stuff well again so the infrastructure team could own that piece right so when it comes time to connect you know to a corp connected segment, right? That's when you do have to go to the infrastructure teams, right? But if it's just Greenfield, dev teams doing their thing, very calm to let them just freely do what they want until it comes time to maybe move it into production or maybe connect it to, you know, a segment that needs a little more security or controls around it. Just one final comment on that before, yeah. precisely the problem you mentioned, right? Now imagine taking that across three clouds, right? Mm -hmm. The set of semantics is a set of governance policies, is a set of guardrails for AWS, has one for GCP, has one for, um, you know, uh, Azure. Now imagine replacing that with a single set of semantics, even governance becomes an easier problem, right? Because you're, you're speaking a common policy language yeah. across all these clouds, right? So uh, because this is a full stack transit, we are talking at various layers. Uh, if you want to speak networks, we'll talk networks to you. If you want to speak applications, we'll talk applications to you. If you want security as an outcome, zero trust network security, we'll give that to you. If you want connectivity as an outcome, we'll give that to you, right? Yeah, I'm just, I, I work in an enterprise and there are, I don't say there's a lot of silos, but there's a lot of organizations within. You can say there's silos. Yeah. There's plenty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're segmented. So a product like this would be, um, if you bring it into a large enterprise, there's going to be a lot of gray fuzzy lines because usually somebody has to own the product. Like who's going to own it? Who's going to maintain it? And especially if it goes down, right? Who's going to get in trouble yeah. if it's down? Um, who do you call? So I'm just trying to think like where, how would an enterprise own this? What organizations within the enterprise would take ownership and, and how they would segment that out? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it varies organization to organization based on how they're structured. Um, you know, we had this talk the other day, actually, around you go back pre-cloud, you know, these big organizations spending millions of dollars on pretty much all shared infrastructure. It had to be shared because of the 
the cost. Mm -hmm. So now when you deal with a large organization, you end up really dealing with a bunch of small organizations because each BU is doing their own thing. Each line of business is doing their own thing. So the sphere of control they have is much smaller, right? Even though the company is the still big entity, it's all these little small pieces. Now, the long answer is, you know, an app team could own this platform, right? If there was value that they saw that we were bringing that they wanted to bring in, they could own the whole thing end to end. I think traditionally, though, your cloud platform team or your infrastructure team is likely the team that would own the platform, but it does vary organization to organization. We've seen all three, actually. Yeah. So okay. uh, with, with our customer base, we've seen guys who want to just set up the transit. I'm going to set up the London Underground and then, you know, stations are going to connect. What's your largest customer base? Like your largest customer, what's their like user base and, and you know? Uh, so they're connecting 35 BUs. We have this in the multi-cloud uh, networking um, space, right? And that's the use case. Um, it, Pain becomes acute when they're larger because now they are talking about 24 regions, four different mm -hmm. cloud providers. They're still, the six data centers are not going away anywhere. Now they are in charge as a centralized cloud platform team. Doesn't matter what the BUs are doing. They can, they have freedom to choose their own cloud, their own things. When they want to attach to something that is common, that is where this thing comes become a very, very abstracted layer of doing things, right? Okay. That's right. The largest customer going back to the question, 24 regions, four clouds, I think 150,000 employees, a large global conglomerate. Sorry. 